ought to change our lives. But, you know, as we interact with the scriptures, God speaks to us. And sometimes it's challenging and sometimes it's humbling and sometimes it's encouraging. But it's always about helping us see a bigger picture of who our God is. And at the same time, seeing how God wants us to think and act and treat others differently. And as we've looked through this, this chapter, these chapters, one through four, we have watched and heard how Paul has interacted. And you remember, Paul wrote this uh, being in house arrest. So it's not like he's sitting in a comfy office somewhere with air conditioning and a snack bar outside where they make snacks and bring them around for all the, the great writers. You know, it's not like he's in a house in the woods where he gets up every morning and makes his bacon and eggs and smells it waffling through the house and then sits on his porch as the sun comes up over. So he's not sitting in this place of comfort and, and ease. He's sitting chained to a Roman soldier and he's writing back and he's thinking back about this interaction that he's had maybe six months, a year, two years previous with this fellowship that God used him to build and fill upon. And the context here is that Epaphras had brought this gift and that the, the people of Philippi, they had been already supporting him as he went to Thessalonica and other places, and we're going to read a little bit about that in chapter 4. But somehow the folks in Philippi, they lost Paul. Now, I'm not sure how you lose somebody, but they lost him where it was not easy to get him a gift. And then one day they found out where he was. And almost, you can almost picture the congregation saying, oh, we know where he is. Let's pull together some money and send it to him because he was such an influencer in our families. And so as we look here in chapter four, Paul has written all these different pages of this letter and he's coming to an end, and he's wanting to encourage them. Chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, picking up in verse 10. As Paul writes, I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this, and the parenthetical, I'm not saying this just because you sent me money. Or because I'm in need and needing your money. For I have learned, verse 11, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret to being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more, I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply, will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he ends this last section, greetings to the saints in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. 
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, you really get a sense of his tenderness toward these people. Partly for their gift, but even more than that. Because he had a place in their heart for them. You know, one sign of maturity in our life is the ability to be thankful for what we have. Thankfulness is an overflow of gratitude for what we have rather than an obsession with what we ought to have. Gratitude, thankfulness. I remember every, every kid has a different uh, threshold for saying thank you. Uh, my daughter Heidi found saying thank you to be very easy just sort of flipped off her tongue Sometimes I kind of wonder if she knew that she had said it But it always came out my son Ben on the other hand uh, He was always captivated by whatever he received and So he was enamored with the thing and so saying thank you was few and far between and so we had to rail on him to say you get it, say thank you. You get it, say thank you. You know, you've had kids. You probably noticed that some kids, they just, they just sort of whips off quicker than just stop. And then sometimes you're like, kid, hey, didn't they give you that? Did you say thank you? Uh, no. We'll go back and say thank you. You know, you have to remind our kids. You know, kids are not, I don't think kids are any different today than they were 50 years ago. Kids are obsessed with getting stuff for themselves, right? Uh, we might be able to say the same about adults, but we won't go to metal. Children are classically ungrateful because it's all about me. It's all about what I want, what I think will make me happy. But when we mature, at least one of the signs of maturity is that we have figured out how to be grateful for what it is that we have. Because we understand we cannot have it all. And I wonder if having it all might actually be bad for us. I mean, if you get everything you want all the time, does that build much character? I don't think so. It seems beneficial to struggle along, to learn to be happy. In fact, even Paul wrote in verse 11, he says, for I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. He learned it. it. It just didn't come natural to him, just like it doesn't come natural to us or to our children. He learned. Paul, having experienced poverty and wealth, writes to these believers with a heart of thanksgiving because of their engagement in the gospel and at this point in their gift let's look at three different principles or ideals that this text highlights that will help us think more thankfully and i'll tell you what they are first is divine contentment the second is divine strengthening and the third is divine provision so divine contentment, divine strengthening, and then divine provision. The first, ha the happiest people are those who experience divine contentment. We talked about Paul's situation here. And he lists in verse 11 and 12, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. But he learned contentment. If you flip back with me to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians, just a few pages, just a few clicks. 2 Corinthians 11. Let's look at some of the things that helped Paul learn contentment. Starting in verse 16, 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16. But I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. 
In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. He's being sarcastic there just a bit. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you, exploits you, takes advantage of you, pushes himself forward, slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. What does anyone dare boast about? Verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked so much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, because they didn't want to go over 40, so they did 39 just in case they miscounted. So kind. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been consistently on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. He sounds like he has a pretty easy life. You know, all things considered. I mean, it's just the country and the city and the Gentiles and the Jews. I mean, just you. 27. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? You know, Paul understood weakness, and he understood suffering. And yet he could write in Philippians 4, I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. You know, I, I look at our lives, and I know some of our lives have had some challenges. Some of your stories have had tearful and desperate challenges. And as I read Paul's description in some of these things, I think, you know, we've endured some things too. Every man's suffering is bad for that man. Even if it's not as bad as Paul where you've been shipwrecked, none of us were on the Titanic and survived. I mean, we never, I mean, most of us have never gone down in a boat and wondered if we weren't going to make it. But your suffering has been hard for you. Your suffering has been challenging. Your suffering has has made you question whether God was good. Just like Paul's did. So what was Paul's secret? I think his secret, he talked about it in chapter 3 and into the first part of chapter 4. That he found in God this present awareness of the one who created the world, who stepped into all of the things that left him hollow and wanting, all of the places that he had worked so hard for that somehow didn't meet up, that when God stepped in and knocked on his door and and crashed through, that there was this divine satisfaction that God enabled him to discover that made all those things okay. And that's why when I look here and think about Thanksgiving, I think about the happiest people are the people who experience divine contentment. And what I'm saying there is what Paul said is that he found that this connection with the God of the universe was so immense that it was enough to put all of his physical suffering in perspective. Contentment is the position of being satisfied, having just what's needed, a quietness of heart 
with what you possess. Contentment isn't about what you have on the outside as much as it is about how we think about things on the inside. And we've all known wealthy people that are so discontented with what they have that they're hard to live with. And yet we've, had, we've known wealthy people that you would never know that they had money because it was never a thing. We've all known poor people that always complain about everything. And yet we've known poor people that didn't have anything but seemed like they were the most relaxed, contented people in all the world. How come? Well, what Paul's pointing out is that there's something that goes beyond the presence of or the lack of money. And Paul, I believe, would point at Jesus, the gospel, the amazing gift that God gave us in Christ that stepped into all of our poverty, all of our need, and gave us a place in heaven that was ours someday, someday. The happiest people experience divine contentment. Divine contentment is so much more about how God our Father loves us in Christ that what we have is enough. Few gifts changed my family like video games. I don't know if you ever bought your kids video games, but we bought our kids video games. There are some times I thought that was the greatest idea in all the world, and there are other days where I think that I could have been like the guy on YouTube that kept getting tired of telling his kid to go and do work. And so one day his student son, 15 years old, got home from school. There was a note on the door that said, come on out back, son. And his dad was sitting on a riding lawnmower. And his video games were sitting on the ground. And he rolled that lawnmower over those video games. To his son's utter amazement. So nothing changed our family quite like video games. It was because I never understood how powerfully video games influenced my kids' perspective of reality. That there was something about stopping this game midway that brought out the worst in my kids, as if that was reality. Now, I don't think video games are terrible. I think what it did is it showed me the reality of my own heart. That we get fixated on things so much that when they get pulled away from us, we've convinced ourselves that we need those things to bring us satisfaction. And when those things disappear, whether they're people or houses or jobs or positions of influence, whether it's our health, our comfort, our security, when those things get pulled away, we see for ourselves that we are less content than what we ever imagined. Paul here is talking about a picture where our contentment lies in a place, in a person, not in our stuff that we possess. Divine contentment. The happiest people experience divine contentment. You know, in the end, what did we bring into this world? What are you going to take out of this world? And the whole lot we're taking out of this world. It's all going to stay. Jesus said it well in the Beatitudes. Is your life not worth more? Is your, is your life not worth more than all this? Divine contentment grows when we take interest in God more than God's provisions. The gift God gives us are wonderful. They're blessings. Solomon said, these are good. But Solomon also said, all this, all this is just going to go away. Vanity, vanities. Enjoy it, but don't live for it. A.B. Simpson said it well. Once it was the gift, 
Now it's the giver. The happiest people are those that have discovered divine contentment. The second, the strongest people. As Paul continues there, he says, I am not saying this because I'm in need, verse 11, for I have learned that whatever the circumstances, God will take care of me. God is with me. I know what it is to be in need, poverty, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret to being satisfied in every and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, that I can do everything through him who gives me strength. The strongest people are those who experience divine strengthening. In Paul's life journey, his purpose is achievable, not because of his talents or his abilities, but because of the God who has called him and it will strengthen him. I don't think he's saying that those things in 2 Corinthians 11 weren't terrible. I think he would say that being shipwrecked and stuck in the water for a day and a half would be terrible. But I think that when he got back on shore and he saw how God preserved his life, he talked about how God was his strength. And the things that we go through that are terrible are genuinely terrible at times. And as we get through them, we have two choices. Either we can look back and say, we did it ourselves because we're so powerful. Or we can recognize that the God who made us carried us through. One cultivates a heart of thanksgiving for the strength that God has provided. And one, well, it's all about me, which is probably at the root of our dissatisfaction. The strongest people are the people who have discovered God's strengthening. At the beginning of last year, if you were in our family or connected, you heard Marsha talk about some of the challenges that she experienced at school. And one of those challenges were, was around safety patrol. And that experience, like many of your experiences, when something goes wrong and it continues to go wrong and it continues to be challenging, eventually it becomes consuming. Anyone ever been there? been consumed by that thing where you just can't get it out of your head and it, it wakes you up at night and it keeps you up at night and it wakes you up in the morning and it just sucks you all in and no matter how you go you can't get away from it we've been there I've been there as Marcia came home we talked about these things we talked about how God has placed you there and how God is with you there and there's one day she came home and like she had this lightness and this brightness I said well what what kind of like different she said well I decided I, I just got to give up and God's got to help me God's got to take care of this thing God's got to rescue me and I can't there was something that was freeing you've experienced it where God strengthened you after you got to a place where you recognized that it was more about God's mission and less about your comfort but you have, it's strange how we have to get to the end of our abilities before we recognize God wants to step in with his strengthening. Paul is writing about this theme. Now, everybody takes this verse out of context, and they say, well, I can do everything through him who gives me strength, so I can jump over all of you in a single bound, because I can do everything through God who gives me strength. And just to prove it, I'm going to run, and I'm going to hit this first deck, and I'm probably going to go about midway. Wendy, prepare yourself, because here I come. It doesn't matter how much I believe that I can leap tall buildings in a single bound, that I can stop big immovable objects. It doesn't matter that I, I can do everything through Christ. I can, I can become the salesman that I've always dreamed. Let me tell you, I can't. I tried it. It's miserable. I don't want to do it again. This is not a text that we can apply to every challenge to say, Okay, this is a challenge. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, so I'm going to suck it up. This text refers to people that are pursuing the kingdom of God, and you're living out your faith in your context. Now, it might be true that God strengthens you, but if you look to the context of where he's writing this, he's writing to people about him pursuing the kingdom mission. And he's saying, I can do all these things 
what things? I can flesh out the kingdom of God in my every problem and every stress and every trial and every hardship. Not because I'm superhuman, but because God gives me strength. See, there's a different perspective there. When we see all the things that go on in our lives as part of God's purposes for His glory, that means that if I get a flat tire on the way to work, which is terrible, okay, it's terrible. If you get a flat tire no matter where it is, it's terrible. If you're on your way to work and you're late to a meeting, it's even worse. But you can confidently say if you're thinking about being God's missionary in that space, that God has a purpose and God has a reason and it's going to work out. When my lung collapsed and it changed my life forever, it's just part of the thing. When my back hurts, it's part of this journey. But is, is God not bigger than all these physical things? You know, I know Becky's struggling with her knee replacement and it's taken a long time to get better. And I know there have been days when she sort of wanted to have it all over. Let's, let's get this thing done and be finished. But I also know that in that journey that she knows that God has called her and God is walking with her and God is with her in that hardship. And so she can say, you know, I can do everything through him who gives me strength because my life is God's life and my journey is God's journey and I am not journeying alone. There's a perspective that comes to us with God strengthening on our journey. But I think our culture has persuaded us that most of us, what we need is an easier life. I think our culture has persuaded us that most of what we need is just more comfort. So we just really need a, a job that makes more money. Because if we had a job that made more money, our lives would be good. So people who make more money have more problems. They have more to worry about, more stuff to break, more stuff to fix. I don't know, it's all glory and glitz on the other side. Our culture has convinced us that if we just achieve this status, like everything will come together and it will be easy and perfect. And really what it is is that we'll get to a place where we don't need God. We don't need help. We don't need other people. We have everything we need to take care of all of our stuff. And if we just get there, we're at the right place. Well, if we just get there, what have we just achieved? We're our own little gods. And if we're our own little gods, what does that do to the one in heaven? Well, what does he say? He opposes the proud, little gods. We're our own maker. But he gives grace to the humble, the ones who acknowledge that they have needs. What does it sound like to you? Do you want to live a life where you got it all together and you got all the money in the world, but there's a space in there that's just feels weak? Or do you want to live a life that has needs but recognizes and sees that the hand of God has come to provide? So that brings us to the third picture. Not only is it, are the happiest people the ones who experience divine contentment, or the strongest people those who experience divine strengthening, the securest people are those who experience divine provision. The securest people. Look what he says in verse 14. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel. When I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. So you can clearly see there's a relationship here, and they have been generous to him. Verse 17, not that I am looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. So there's an attitude of gratitude on Paul's side. I've received full payment, and even more, I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you have sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. So as they have given to Paul... And frequently folks gave to Paul out of their littles, not out of their bigs. 
Paul says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. As we give ourselves to the kingdom, God says, you can't outgive me. If you are living for my kingdom, if you are giving for my kingdom, not giving to my kingdom on the earth, and there are a lot, in fact, I was with Alan Angela Springer, we were together last night, and uh, we enjoyed just a, a great dinner, we were talking about big churches in the Alliance, and he cited a church that he has friends at that uh, spent uh, $750,000 on their AV and lights, and they went back and spent another million to upgrade things, and he said, for what? It's just lights. <laughs> you know, sometimes pastors have this version that we ought to give more money so that we can spend it on more stuff. Now, granted, sometimes some of that is necessary in our culture, and I'm not diminishing some of those things. But what Paul seems to be saying here is it's not about building the edifice to your name. It's about giving to kingdom priorities. You know, that's one of the things that the Christian Mission Alliance have always done really well. That there's a high number of dollars that go through the Great Commission Fund into missions around the world. You know, I, you come to this church and you're part of the Christian Mission Alliance, but I don't know that you really grasp how big that God has done the Christian Mission Alliance globally. Like globally, God has used this little band of, of believers in the Christian Mission Alliance that there are six million believers that worship on the Lord's Day around the world because of the, this little band in the Christian Mission Alliance. Because we give and have given, God has returned and provided immensely. If you look at the budget of Southern Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention and the millions of dollars that go into that organization, and then you look at the 2,000 churches and 200,000 people that is part of the, the CNMA in the United States. Overseas, the CNMA is twice the size of Southern Baptist ministry. I say that to say, giving to the kingdom matters. And as we give to the kingdom, God promises to care for us. Now, he doesn't care to bring it back to us dollar for dollar. You know, as a kid, I remember, and I, I still to this day, I don't carry cash in my pocket. And the reason I don't carry cash in my pocket, because every time the offering plate goes by, God says to me, you have money in your pocket. You should put it in there. <laughs> and I don't know if it's God or if it's just my, like, there goes the basket and my parents, like, ingrained in me, give, give. But I remember, like, having the basket go by as a kid. And having these dollar bills that I had gotten for my birthday. And God said, put that money in there. I was like, oh, Lord, you keep doing this to me. And I dropped my money in. And, you know, God gave it back. Like, I would get this card in the mail from this aunt that I didn't even know knew my birthday that had, like, $4, and I had dropped into. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Now, I, I don't think it works like that. I'm not a health and wealth guy where you just should give because God's going to return to you ten times over. I think that's nonsense. But the context of what he's telling us here is Paul is writing to this Philippian church who most likely gave sacrificially to Paul because of the cause, because of the mission, the partnership in the gospel. And Paul is saying, even as God has taken care of me, God will take care of you. God will make up for you and he will supply what you need in your hardship. Trust him. Trust him. Don't just be a person who looks at money and says, if I have enough money, I'm secure. Look to the God who is enough to say the God who provides is the God who will take care of me. And God may not fill your pockets with money, but he will, he will give you enough to get by. 
and make you joyful in the process. I, rem I remember stories where, I, I don't remember exactly when this was, but I remember Marsha telling me a story where we were getting low on food and she prayed that God would provide and one of you years ago brought us groceries. You didn't even know. I don't understand how it works. George Mueller, uh, Tony had talked about George Mueller and a praying guy in England with the orphanages. Like, his story is that he prayed, and what happened? God provided. You know, the milk guy breaks down in front on his big tractor, and all of a sudden he's like, well, I can't get the milk off. Do you guys need some? Well, I was just praying about that. Or, you know, the bread guy, he says, you know, I got to get up. The Lord said I ought to get up and go make some bread and take it over to George's family, George's orphanage. So he, he got up early, he made all his bread, and took it in. Sure enough, they didn't have any bread for that day. I mean, these are all the things that... I, I kind of wonder if God sits upstairs... That's a terrible analogy. I kind of wonder if God in heaven, wherever he is... Okay, I don't know exactly how that fits together. But I kind of wonder if he is not there with this reserve of provisions... And he says, when well, my people look like they think they got it all taken care of, I guess they don't need me. They look like they've, they're, they are so focused on all that stuff that they're trying to figure out how to fix. I guess they don't need me. But I wonder if he doesn't have this reserve that he wants to, you know, but... If we don't need it, and we don't ask for it, he wants, I mean, this text seems to say that if you're living for my kingdom and you're giving to the things that I value, that the, you're making the investments in what I value, I, as the God in heaven, am going to supply your needs according to my riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And some of those provisions are going to be monetary. Arlie McGarvey back years ago said every time he prayed for money, God sent him a job. <laughs> you know, so sometimes. But I, I know it's not one for one. Like I, I, know, I talked to David Quarles back here, and he has been looking for a job a lot. And it hasn't materialized. I know Tammy's been looking for some money to get her wrist done again. It's been a hard go. I know lots of us have had the sense of not having enough. And there's definitely a piece here where my God will support all your needs. But the context again is this having a, an attitude of the kingdom that permeates our giving. It's not saying, I can go out and charge the living daylights out of my credit card and then put my finger in this chapter and say, oh, Lord, you said my Christmas shopping is done, but you said. So there's, there's a little context as we work these things out. A gentleman named Charles Fuller was on the radio years ago. He left an orange-growing business to preach the gospel through radio. And in one of the books that was written about his life, he tells a story. He said that George had trouble finding radio stations that would carry his preaching because they had policies against religious broadcasting. But God opened the door for him to take the Sunday evening slot on a radio station called KNX, the voice of Hollywood. As if anybody needed it, Hollywood probably did. This was an exciting thing because KNX planned on increasing its broadcast to cover the entire West Coast, Alaska, and Hawaii. So that's pretty wide range. But the Sunday time slot was expensive. Some of my grandfather's, George's friends, urged him not to move ahead, but he believed God was calling him to do it, so he made the commitment to go. One Thursday, it looked like he had made a mistake. The next day, he owed KNX Radio $500. I think this was in the mid-40s. So it was not like 500 was 500 today. 
He only had $350. So there he sat, eyeing the phone, wondering if he should make the call to cancel. Finally, with great regret, he decided to make the call. But as he reached for the phone, it rang. A dentist friend who had come to faith through his radio broadcast was calling. His first words, Charlie, do you need any money? George was shocked. Charles, Charles Fuller, Charles was shocked and answered, why, yes, I do. The dentist responded, well, then come on over and see me. So Charles Fuller drove over to the dentist's home. When he got there, the dentist asked him how much money he needed, and Charles answered, $150. The dentist turned to his wife with a stunned look on his face and pulled from his pocket a check he had already made out to my grandfather, Charles, for exactly $150. And the dentist explained what had happened. He said that his wife woke him up the previous night and said, we have to give Charles Fuller $150 tomorrow. But the dentist explained to his wife that they only had $25 in the bank, okay? So it's not like there's this rolled, bank rolled. But she insisted, I don't care, we've got to do it. And the dentist didn't know what to say, so he suggested they talk about it the next day, and they went back to sleep. Well, the next morning, he went to his dental office as usual, but he, while, while he was there, a patient unexpectedly arrived and said that he had come to pay his overdue dental bill, which was for $800. When the bill was paid, the dentist immediately wrote a check for $150 to my grandfather, Charles Fuller. And then he drove home to tell his wife what has happened. Then he called Charles to give, tell him to come over without knowing anything about how close my Charles was to canceling his time slot on the radio station. They were stunned and strengthened by God's merciful, detailed faithfulness. You know, I think that insecure people focus on what they have. But people who find their security in God's provision believe that God is enough and that somehow some way even if it's hard God will care for us and in that I can be secure it doesn't mean that I'm going to be wealthy it doesn't mean that I'm going to be always filled with turkey and stuffing but it does mean it will be okay and that somehow in this journey, God will be with me. We started with this idea of thankfulness. And thankfulness grows as we experience divine contentment, where God is enough with whatever we have. Being thankful grows when we see God's strength for the challenges as we serve him in our everyday life. And our thankfulness grows as we see God's divine provision. That God can, he has his reservoir ready to support his mission. Do you see the secret, the magic that makes thankfulness grow in Paul's life, in the Philippians' life, and in ours? It's moving ourselves out of the center and positioning God in his rightful place where our contentment is less about our bellies, our circumstances, or our finances. Our resident mechanic, James Hudson, will tell you that a tire that's out of balance is soon to be destroyed. No? True. A tire that's out of balance is soon to either vibrate itself to death and break a belt or overheat or ruin something else on the car. Something's going to happen because a tire that gets out of balance goes like this. It's terrible. But a tire that's perfectly balanced, you could almost spin on the tip of a pen because it rolls perfectly around. You know, as you look at your life, do you feel like your life is going... Or do you feel like your life is spinning pretty well in balance? 
as we wrap up Philippians, Paul's mission in his heart is that the Philippian church should, would be spinning in balance with the kingdom, with the God of the universe, with the mission that he's called them to be part of. And I see the same thing for us. But finding that balance, that's, that's a challenge. That's an everyday walk. That's an experience that goes right along in every moment. A.B. Simpson, the founder of our denomination, said it well. I once thought that the Lord would take me like an old rundown clock and wind me up and set me going like a machine. And it's not like that at all. I found it was himself coming instead and giving me what I needed for the moment. I wanted to have great stock and be wealthy so that I could feel rich, a great store laid up for many years so that I would not be dependent on him for even the next day, but he never gave me such wealth. I never had more holiness or healing at one time than I needed just for that hour. He said, my child, you must come to me for that next breath because I love you so dearly and I want you to come all the time. If I gave you great supply, you would do without me and you would not come to me so often. And I want you to come to me every second and lay on my breast and lean on me every moment. A.B. Simpson wrote that great hymn himself where he said, once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, and now it is his word. Once his gifts I wanted, and now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, and now himself alone. How about you? Is Thanksgiving and Christmas a time for discontent? God wants to be your enough. God wants to be your enough. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I am so grateful. I'm grateful for your word. I'm grateful for your patience with me. I'm grateful for how you reach out to me constantly. I great, I'm, so, I'm so thankful for how you've given me what you've given me. I'm so thankful for my health and, and for the money and that I have food for today and that I can be here with these, my friends, and we get to watch my neighbor's dog. I'm so thankful for how you've provided. But Lord, I need you to be my enough. And that the things that I have today are not guaranteed for my tomorrow. But you are going to be with me tomorrow. So Lord, I ask that you would be with me today that I would know it, that I would sense you, that I would understand that you're here with me. So Lord, I give myself in worship to you because you are worth it. You are enough. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close and sing, I, I pray that you will have a sense of thanksgiving that wells up in you. As you see that God is forever yours. As we sing, if you, if you want to come and pray, if you want to recommit something to the Lord, if you want to kneel where you are or bow or sit and, and just confess that you want him to be your enough, will you do that as we sing? And then we'll close with a benediction.
me that God who delivered the children of 